This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. Well, hey, everyone. I'm Mark Bayer, and you are tuned to When Science Speaks. Today's episode is brought to you by Bayer Strategic Consulting in Washington, D.C., which helps scientists and engineers get funding, gain influence, and build relationships with the stakeholders who matter the most in their professional world. It is so great to have Dr. Seema Yasmin on the show today. Seema is a medical doctor, poet, professor, and professional debunker. She's director of the Stanford University Center for Health Communication, and a clinical assistant professor in the Stanford School of Medicine. Yasmin teaches science journalism and global health storytelling and studies the spread of microbes and misinfodemics. Born in Nuneaton, Warwickshire, and raised in Hackney, London, she lives in California with her pit bull, Lily. You can submit suspected health hoaxes and general inquiries via the contact form at www.seemayasmin.com. And we'll have a link to her fantastic new book, which is called Viral BS Medical Myths and Why We Fall for Them, in the show notes accompanying this episode. Welcome to the show, Seema. Hi, thanks for having me. Now, you've had such an unusual and fascinating career journey so far as a medical doctor disease detective, science reporter, and documentary host. And many of our listeners, a lot of scientists and academics, um, are also navigating career transitions, which can be challenging, as you know. I wonder, just before we really get started in talking about the book, um, thinking about your career, um, are there useful approaches and attitudes that have helped you as you've moved through phases of your professional life so far? I think following your heart, which sounds really corny, but it's something that in a professional sense, we're sometimes told not to do. It's use your head unless your instincts and intuition. That's been really helpful. And then making sure that you really smash out of academic and professional silos. It's really easy to surround yourself all the time with people who are like-minded, have similar career trajectories, similar credentials, and very similar perspectives. And it's critical that you get different outlooks on the world and think about different approaches to your work from speaking with people who are choreographers and poets and just from very different disciplines. So those things have served me very well. Yeah, you know, and I really think as we talk about your book here that it's it's reflected, what you just said is really reflected in your new book, Viral BS, because it's it's such a practical and powerful resource for anyone looking to understand misinformation and make sense of common urban myths like you mentioned, can cat poop? give you a swagger and boost your confidence, which is a personal favorite of mine. Um, (laughs) I haven't tried it yet, but... um, Don't try it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But you, this book is so wonderful because you infuse it with so many different diverse perspectives. And, you know, you write uh, as you're, you know, you wrote about your experience as a public health doctor and saying, you know, those weren't not enough to, you felt they weren't enough to improve public health. And you had to train as an expert storyteller. And as you put it, combining narrative with medicine to make people care, which I think is such a great way of expressing it. Um, I wonder if you would share with listeners, you know, sort of how you came to that realization that, you know, you had to move out of the medical, you know, strictly a medical profession um, only and get out of that sort of silo, as you mentioned, um, how you sort of came to that realization. And then also, you know, how you really marshaled the courage to make that career leap into journalism. It was very unexpected. It was nothing that I had planned or even considered to be a possibility. But what happened is when I was an officer in the epidemic intelligence service, my day job was being sent from one place to another, deployed to wherever there was an outbreak. And 
your job is to figure out what is the contagion, how do you stop the contagion? So it's all these things we're talking about in the context of COVID now is contact tracing and case finding and those very unglamorous and difficult things. And I started to notice a pattern, which I'm an epidemiologist, is what we, what we do is identify patterns. But I noticed that every time I was sent to a hot zone, no matter where it was or what outbreak was spreading, I had this very singular focus on the pathogen, on modes of transmission, on stopping the spread of infection. And actually, it was never just an infection that was spreading, always in tandem, in parallel to whatever microbe was spreading from person to person. There was also information about the microbe, about the situation, about me, about the CDC, about vaccines, about diseases in general that were also spreading from person to person. And there were rumors and health hoaxes and misinformation and disinformation, all of these things, which is the you know information ecosystem that we live in. And yet, as a public health doctor working for the federal government, then we really ignored that stuff and just had this focus on the pathogen, Mm -hmm. even though we knew that the rumors and the hoaxes made it very difficult for us to do our job, made it tricky to do contact tracing and case finding and all of those things. So I thought, this is very myopic. If I'm going to be effective as a public health doctor, then I'm going to need to understand the information ecosystem. And the more I started studying that, the more I realized you have information contagion, you have emotional contagion, all of these things happening in parallel to the kind of more traditional infection and contagion that we think of. And I thought, okay, so if I think to be an effective public health doctor, I'm going to need to work on all of these. How do I train to do that? And I thought, well, you know, who who else is a weirdo like um, epidemic <laughs> intelligence service officers? Who else runs to the epicenter of an epidemic when sensible people are fleeing right. or staying in their homes? And I was mm-hmm. like, journalists, right? And they're They are tackling the information aspect of this. What information is spreading? What information are they going to take out of the contagion zone into the public? Mm. And what they do would really impact my work and people's perception of my work. And so I thought... I think I need to train as a journalist. And I'm more so, I need to train in journalism. Mm-hmm. I don't know what I'll do with that. And at the same time, I learned about this new journalism program that had just started at the University of Toronto, which was a journalism academic program, but it was for people who already were established in a career. Mm-hmm. And it taught you how to report the news in your field of expertise. So there were lawyers and environmental activists and investment bankers and a few doctors. And as I was doing that training, I was approached by a newspaper in Texas who said, you know, when you graduate, we have a job for you here. And I thought, well, I didn't go to medical school to or into the epidemic intelligence service to be a newspaper and television reporter, but that's exactly what happened. And when I did arrive in Texas, just a few months after I started my first journalism job, Ebola arrived in Dallas where I was living right. and all my worlds converged. Amazing. That's just crazy coincidental, but you were in the perfect spot for that. Um, You know, it's interesting because in my work, I often find that storytelling and communication, like that gene isn't necessarily active in research scientists, um, you know, who are devoting their lives to to finding cures to diseases, uh, you know, or in social scientists, you know, Uh, of course, there are always exceptions, but it's almost like the unicorn you know, who has both of those things in one brain. So I have to ask you. I think, you, no, I, I think many of us do. And I think huh? we're just told to turn one or the other off and just lean into one passion or one area of interest mm-hmm. or expertise. I think so many people are multifaceted and are polymathic. And we ju- we just live in a world that's like, no, you are either a scientist or a poet. And there are so many of us that are great at both. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Um, it's it's and it's a shame because like when you talk about public health, it's of course the health training, but it's also like understanding the public part of that too, which is can be really thorny and complicated. Um, well, I'm, I want to know uh, from your perspective, you know, with with your expertise and your high levels of both scientific and storytelling um, uh, talent. First, you know how did this happen, and second, you know. How can scientists who are unaccustomed to communicating with general audiences sharpen their storytelling skills without maybe going to journalism school? <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. And I think even some of the best journalists out there don't have formal journalistic training. I think these are tools that we learn from studying them, sure, but not always in a formal setting, from reading a lot, Mm -hmm. and then from going out there and, and doing it. And I think there are those kind of formal journalism programs like the one I did, which still operates in Toronto. But then there are ways to just kind of do newsroom internships, to take Mm -hmm. creative writing classes, to take podcasting classes, because there are just so many ways of engaging with audiences and telling stories. I think it's really fun to learn that skill across different formats and lean into what's fun for you. One of my former pre-med students who's now in medical school, I'm just learning about, she took one of my uh, global health storytelling classes, Mm -hmm. but I'm only now learning about her as, you know, we stay in touch across different states, but she's an amazing cartoonist and she's using cartoons and and amazing visuals to tell stories about COVID and the Mm -hmm. impact on medical students and healthcare workers. I think it's, it's allowing ourselves the freedom and giving ourselves the permission to lean into those things that we were kind of told, no, you shut that off when you go to medical school. Yeah, I actually want to ask you about that, Dr. Yasmin, a little bit, because talking about that shutting off, like you're told to shut that off. And I hear that a lot too. Like, you know, anytime that you're spending away from the lab is like wait, a waste, you know? And so it must be really difficult to, to kind of persevere and find those opportunities while still like meeting your obligations to your, you know, to your strictly medical research site. Well, and there are definitely times in life where you do have to have a singular focus. Let's be real. Medical school can be very tough. And Mm -hmm. certainly when I was in medical school, I was doing medical school. I didn't have even that many extracurricular activities Mm -hmm. because it was just tough, you know, academically and emotionally and um, in, in terms of stamina in so many different ways. But I think there are electives. There are times in your life. There are just different periods during which we might want to explore those and make sure we give ourselves permission to do so. So I think it's just, that's also being creative and trying Mm -hmm. to figure out how do we combine different passions and, and remembering that even when things feel separate, they can be very symbiotic and actually feed different parts of our work. And Mm -hmm. so you might be playing harp or playing piano and have an idea that translates into your laboratory work or you might be reading a a short story that makes you think differently about a patient and about a a difficult clinical case so there's all this overlap because we create these silos very artificially in our work but they don't exist in real life you know as humans we are not just one thing it's it's so true and I think actually that's where the innovation comes in is bringing those disparate things together that are that are connected but maybe not obviously that's so so cool and you know this kind of leads to my next question which is you know, I was just fascinated by how you write about using learnings from viruses to combat the viral BS or the the misinformation, if you will. And I'd love for you to share a bit about um, what you mean by using your, you know, learnings in the science from virus, from looking at viruses and virology um, to understanding misinformation. And then also, um, you know, how misinformation works. And, and as part of that, you talk about pre-bunking, which I had never heard that term before. And I just thought it was such a great use of it. So can you elaborate a little bit for listeners? Sure. So these are not connections that I made. They're connections that other scientists and scholars made that I then learned about. Mm-hmm. It was like, oh my God, mind blown. So I think the first one was after medical school, I did a clinical fellowship at UCLA in mathematical modeling and kind of got my feet wet in very simple SIR models of who's susceptible, who's infected, who's recovered, the kind of modeling we're doing now with COVID, right? We've been doing mm-hmm. for the last year and a half. That was really interesting to me, but it was still kind of in my ballpark of modeling where an epidemic might go, who might become infected next. What happened then as I started studying more the spread of information, I learned that there were scholars of communication and scholars of information that used the exact same models and very similar differential equations to map not how a virus spread from person to person, but how a a nugget of information spread from one person Mm -hmm. to another person and then to 10 people and then to a million people via the internet or via television or via word of mouth, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. And then there were all these parallels. So, you know, we talk a lot about super spreaders now, but it turns out you have super spreaders of information in the same way that you have super spreaders of 
disease. So you can have super spreaders of an illness, but also super spreaders of disinformation. You have stifles, people with whom the false information or the infection stops. So it was learning all of those parallels that was absolutely fascinating to me and just reminded me that there is this overlap, this convergence, and we shouldn't be trying to separate these things when they are so synchronous. And then the pre-bunking and the inoculation theory you talk about actually comes from the 60s from a social psychologist who was based at Harvard at the time. He was worried or interested in how humans shift behaviors or not, how we stay stuck in particular behaviors and beliefs. And he, in the 60s, took the analogy of how a vaccine works mm -hmm. to think about, well, how might we protect somebody not against a microbe, but protect them against false information that's incoming, false information that's trying to change the way they, they change things they believe or change the way they behave in the world. Mm -hmm. And what this guy was saying was, you know, with a vaccine, very often you're providing a small weakened dose of the thing that could make you sick as a way of giving your body and your immune system the chance to study up on this invader and mm -hmm. to get ready so that when you're hit with the real thing, boom, you've already got this response. You've got this army of antibodies and other immune system components ready to go. So what he was saying is, well, if the doctors and scientists are saying that that works for an infection in the field of social psychology, why don't we try giving people a small and weakened dose of false information and saying to them, here's a thing you're going to be hearing soon. It says, for example, climate change is a hoax invented by Chinese politicians or Chinese scientists. And not only that, but you give them this heads up, you tell them where the false information is coming from, why it's false. You help them develop some counter arguments so that they're ready. And then when they are blasted with this false information from a powerful official, from lots of media outlets, wherever it might be, they're like, aha, I was told about, I was warned <laughs> about this. Not only did I know it was coming, but I have six reasons ready as to why I know that this is inaccurate. And so, you know, this has been around for a while. We've used this idea of inoculation theory and pre-bunking in public health mm -hmm. a little bit, mostly mm -hmm. around things like trying to not get teens to start smoking. And then more recently, mm -hmm. we've seen some scholars, especially at the University of Cambridge, develop interventions to use inoculation theory to get people kind of ready and protected against incoming false information around vaccines and things to do with health and science. Just so great. I love that. I love that. It's um, just fascinating. And, you know, I want to shift a little bit to another aspect that another theme of your book that I found particularly interesting and different from a lot of books on the same subject. And you wrote about trying not to judge false health news that spreads. And you talked about you know, being raised on some conspiracy theories that you experienced and you could understand why a patient might refuse medications uh, or, or buy into some of these conspiracy theories. And you emphasized the emotional and empathic dimension and how that is so important in, in responding to misinformation. A lot of times people try to default to data, which ends up mostly backfiring and even making, yeah, making things worse many times. Um, would you share, you know, why you use this approach and, and whether you think em empathy, generally speaking, is used enough in our efforts to short circuit viral BS? I don't know if it's used enough because I think it can get very frustrating when you're dealing mm. with people who are like, no, I don't believe in vaccines. Oh, I'm not going to wear a mask. I understand where those frustrations come mm -hmm from because I share them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, I always say we practice and teach evidence-based medicine and we really should practice and teach evidence-based communication mm -hmm. too, because there is an art and a science to it. And what we've understood from that is that just doubling down on the quote unquote facts can sometimes just drive people to dig their heels in deeper. Mm -hmm. It's also really naive because it presumes they haven't already seen the data that you're going to share. And it, clearly if they've seen it and they are still not in agreement with it, then it didn't do much to sway their beliefs. And actually what happens is we assume that everyone who holds a particular worldview came to that worldview or may, is making that decision from the same place with the same context, the same history, the same cultural background. And of course, it's not true. And so the empathy comes in because you need to first, before you develop an intervention, before you intervene in any way, 
you need to understand why someone believes what they believe. And you can't do that unless you're asking questions and then listening really deeply. Mm -hmm. And I think that act of asking a question, caring enough to be quiet and listen, that's where empathy really comes in. And it's easy to say, it's really hard to do when the person in front of you is a voracious anti-vaxxer say or someone who doesn't want to wear an anti-mask uh, right. someone who is anti-mask and doesn't mm -hmm. want to you know put some cloth on their face to protect themselves and others but it is demonstrated to be very powerful in actually having a conversation that's productive as opposed to having a conversation where they're saying their facts you're saying your facts because the research shows that just pouring more facts onto a polarized conversation is like pouring kerosene onto a fire <laughs> yeah and yet we still do it over and over again and that was something that i wanted to ask you about because you know you know these are things the value of emotion the importance of the credibility of the speaker you know things that aristotle was writing about like 2000 years ago and it just seems like sometimes we have to learn this same lesson over and over again when we seek to persuade. Um, this reflex to like just default to facts and data and sort of telling and directing rather than asking with authenticity as you, as you point out. I'd just like to get your comment uh, on that idea. On, on specifically what part of it? Just like, does it seem like we, we have to learn the same lessons over and over <laughs> again? Part. I mean, like- <laughs> The frustrating you know. part, right. I mean, you know, in public health, we do talk about this thing called the panic neglect cycle. We speak about it very specifically to epidemics and public health crises. And the, it's a, it describes a pattern where we panic, panic, panic in the acute phase of a crisis. And then when it's done, we're like, ah, it's done. Okay, now let's move on. Let's not replenish the strategic national stockpile with N95 respirators because, you know, we may need them again in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I think we do, I think it stems from a coping mechanism and need to move on. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, one of the things that I teach is crisis management. And one of, one of the things we learn in crisis management is that all crises have a life cycle. And one of those stages, one of those phases of the life cycle is the post-crisis phase. And one of the most important things to do there is deep learning mm -hmm. and not just the hey ho it was done there's now what's next right mm -hmm. um past the peas what's for lunch it's like no we need to talk about what just happened and what we messed up and what we might do differently and i think sometimes we are good at skipping that phase because it requires asking difficult questions and it can be uncomfortable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes tough it's tough at that point it's almost like you need a, a breath to you know catch your breath or something right. um you know, this isn't a political podcast, at least a partisan political podcast. You know, my background is democratic politics, and that's not what I'm talking about here when I ask you this question. But it does seem like, at least in my lifetime, this public health emergency, this pandemic has been politicized in a partisan way, much more. I think they always are, though. I mean, well, not always. I mean, there have definitely been other crises, but different. But mm -hmm. I, I mean... Having done epidemic investigations, and yes, I worked for the government to do them, I still say that public health is small p political. And so, mm -hmm. you know, often even when I'm on CNN, I'll get asked a question that's prefaced with, you know, we don't want to make it political, but or let's take the politics out of it. And, and it's like, uh -huh. no, you can't. That's really an artificial way of trying to divorce the real mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. um, these things are political and they nearly always have been. And, yeah. and we should be having the conversation in a holistic way that addresses why that is and, and talks about the intricacies of that. Yeah, so so true. And I just want to ask you sort of two follow-ups that, that relate to what you just said, Dr. Yasmin. One is like, I wonder if because you've, you know, your your scope is international and you were traveling all around the world looking at these things and I'm wondering looking at systems outside the US versus inside, um, whether you've seen a disparity with respect to sort of the political small p interplay between science and sort of, you know, the the government. I guess, um, if there's been any kind of things that you've noted here, or there, or it's just, it's always political in the terms of it's always about power and, you know, who gets listened to mm -hmm. and, and who doesn't. And, you know, I say like, you know, power thing about power is a zero sum game. Like you have more of it. That means that they're not listening to me as much. Um, but just anything that maybe, you know, your, your perspective on in, from an international, a global perspective, um, are we kind of seeing here what, you know, you've seen other places or you maybe even, you know, delved into at other places in the U.S.? 
I think there are similar dynamics at play across large swathes of the world, mm -hmm. largely because we've seen an increase in populist, nationalist authorities. And so some of the same issues that we've grappled with here have played out to different extents in different countries. Mm -hmm. um, but even thinking now, you know, as the Delta variant spreads through some parts of southern China, especially, and lockdowns are happening there again, and mass testing is happening again, I think we're just reminded of what China was able to do in terms of uh, the biggest quarantine we've ever seen mm -hmm. um, in, in March or early last year. And that was possible because of politics. And so we're clearly, we're always making that choice. There's this interesting story um, from the mid 20th century mm -hmm. where an American public health scientist goes to Brazil and is like, right, we can eradicate the mosquito that spreads malaria. And it's like, really, we can do that? That's amazing. And the way you do it is by mandating that every single person lets government workers into their house to spray everything down with a really, really toxic chemical that's now banned. And so I'm always thinking about what does politics allow us to do? Who does it allow us to help? Who does it exclude? And then what, what is that balance as we're thinking now in terms of vaccine mandates between right. civil liberties, autonomy, and the state interjecting itself into your decisions about your body? Right. And I keep coming back to trust, you know, this lack of trust in the government say to do that right. based on things that have happened. So as we wrap up, I have to ask you, you know, you know, we're, we're in right in the middle or we're at some point of the Delta variant. I don't, you know, better than I do. We're, we're, I guess it's a dominant variant right now in the U S as we're yeah. talking in the beginning of August. Do you think there are any lessons from campaigns <laughs> to respond to misinformation during earlier waves of the virus, you know, that we should be, and maybe no, already are applying? I don't think we've done a good response at addressing the misinformation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's, again, it's part of the poor pandemic preparedness in that we failed to think about building the nation's scientific literacy and health literacy mm. as crucial components of pandemic preparedness. Because, hello, here we are changing regulations as evidence shifts and as the virus mutates. And that appears mm. to much of the public as flip-flopping indecisiveness and right. scientists don't know what they're doing, right? right. Um, and then the other issue that is of myself and others for the last 10 years have been addressing and thinking about and worrying about and studying this issue of the spread of misinformation and disinformation related to health, mm -hmm. framing it as a national security issue mm -hmm. and being told for so many years by domestic and international public health agencies, you're exaggerating, vaccine coverage is broadly good, you're, you know, it's hyperbolic to think about the anti-vaccine movement growing, only to be hit with a pandemic that's completely been fueled by a concurrent misinfodemic. And so there's been these failures to address the things that are happening now, the things that are converging now to really cause this perfect storm of a situation where you have a virus that is fueled by people's lack of scientific literacy, lack of health literacy, distrust in the government, often for some communities, very legitimate, mm -hmm. historical and current reasons, and also just failure to address misinformation and disinformation as actual threats to our public health and to national security. Yeah, it's so true. And I'm just I'm just reminded of something that we talked about a little bit earlier, which is your the pre-bunk idea. Like when you're talking about CDC making some changes based on the science, like has anyone ever said, you know, from a from a podium or on CNN or any of these other networks, like any scientists ever said, like, you know what, we may have to change our guidance, you know? I I mean, not in a way that I think would be really transparent and mm. helpful to the public mm -hmm. and help them, for example, help an Angelino understand. Well, I live in, before the CDC changed its guidance, well, you know, I live in Los Angeles County. My county health authority is saying I must wear a mask indoors, but the federal government scientists are saying masks are not needed indoors, even if you're vaccinated. Mm -hmm. How are we expecting the public to not only grapple with that misalignment in the messaging, but how are we expecting the public to trust us and understand us and our shifting decision-making when we're not giving those really essential explanations. And those will be the last words on today's episode. Just so wonderful, Dr. Seema Yasmin. You have such a great way of explaining, describing, um, and you bring together all these different ways of thinking that what was really we need to bring to bear to deal with something so difficult as the pandemic.
Thank you so much for this really fascinating conversation. Thanks for having me. And listeners, thank you so much for being here on this episode of When Science Speaks. And I hope you'll be back next time for the next episode of When Science Speaks. This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. 